name is Jason Wallace. I'm the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church here in the Salt Lake Valley, and we welcome you to another installment of the Ancient Paths. Before we get started this evening, I'd like to invite you to come to a debate we're doing this Friday evening, April 24th, at the Social and Behavioral Auditorium at the University of Utah that's located between the stadium and the library. Uh, there's a map on our website if you would like to see that. I'll be debating uh, Pastor Scott Dalgarno of the Mainline Presbyterian Congregation, Wasatch Presbyterian, over on the east side. Uh, we're going to be debating whether homosexuality is consistent with Christianity. He is a member of the PCUSA. They have just redefined marriage, that it is no longer simply between a man and a woman, but can be between people of the same sex. And so we're going to be talking about, is that consistent with what the Bible teaches? If you'd like more information on that, you can go to our website, gospelutah.org, or you can give us a call at 801-969-7948. Well, it's our privilege to have with us this evening uh, Mr. Grant Palmer. He has been with us several times in the past. He is retired from the LDS Church Education System and is the author of An Insider's Look at Mormon Origins and um, great scholar on these matters and he's been very gracious to join us to discuss William Law this evening and so uh, great to have you with us. Thank you. Uh, people often know a little bit about the Nauvoo Expositor that there were there's generally some vague idea there were some LDS dissidents who were publishing things about Joseph Smith but it wasn't just any dissident was it? It was actually a former member of the first presidency uh, William Wall. Yes, uh, he was second counselor to Joseph Smith, and uh, he was uh, probably the most prominent person to ever leave the church in the first presidency. Well, who was William Wall? Well, he was born in Ireland in uh, 1809. He, uh, in, he came to America, to Pennsylvania, when he was 10 years old. Uh, and then he went up to Toronto, Canada, and there he met his wife, Jane, and he was very successful in uh, uh, creating uh, lumber mills and w a variety of mills, as far as I know. And then he came to, he converted to the church, he and his wife, and then they came to Nauvoo in 1839. And then just two years later, I think because of his leadership and his uh, wealth, uh, he was a very prominent uh, business person. He's elevated to the first presidency in January of 41. So he's, he's really uh, only in Nauvoo two years, and he has, was given that uh, distinction. So how do you think he reached such a high level so quickly? Well, like I, I said, I think because of his, uh, he obviously had leadership. He, he was a, a, a business manager, owner of mills, and, uh, and directed people. He did seem did the, did a good job of doing that, and I think that the fact that he had quite a bit of influence and money for a growing Nauvoo. But uh, there are probably other factors. So you wrote an article that's available on the internet, and we'll have a, a link to that. I um, I don't know that we'll have a graphic for it, but it, uh, we'll link it from our uh, from our church website if nothing else. The, uh, you, you gave three reasons why William and Jane Law left the Mormon church. What, what do you see that led to this big break that here's a man who has this meteoric rise, he, he becomes a member of the first presidency, and yet he ends up leaving the, the church. He's the highest ranking person to leave. Well, exactly, and he's, uh, even in, in 1841, he, he thinks Joseph is a, is a prophet, uh, all we could expect to, from a prophet. He's very favorable, but by mid-42, and as he, the last two years of Joseph Smith's life, William Law and Jane and the others become very disenchanted with him. Uh, uh, I mean, they says they observed him, he broke six of the Ten Commandments and pretty well gutted the Sermon on the Mount. And, this, and, the, and these are people, if you read their Nauvoo Expositor, they say right in there, we believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. We believe in the Doctrine and Covenants. There wasn't yet a pretty great price. So they're leaving for his behavioral reasons uh, is, is found in the Ten Commandments. These are the things that are really upsetting them. 
So the first thing that you list is that uh, William Law was, was concerned about Joseph Smith threatening the lives of those that disagreed with him. Yes, I mean, you have to ask the question, why would someone who was so enthusiastic about Joseph Smith and, and believed he was a prophet, and then all of a sudden he becomes very, very opposed to him during the last two years of his life? Uh, why would he do that? And uh, tonight we're going to discuss three of those main reasons that William and Jane Law left the church. And I suspect this will be surprising to many LDS people, because if you were like me, you grew up that William Law was just a scoundrel. He was a terrible person. But really, everything I've been able to find about him, he was, he was a really good man. He, was, he, he, was, he, uh, he left Nauvoo in uh, June of 44. Uh, he felt his life was threatened. And uh, he, he mentioned that uh, he thought Joseph and Hiram Smith had tried to, to do away with him right after he... Uh, left the church or was uh, excommunicated from the church and uh, by poisoning by other means and he says they watched it uh, the people in Nauvoo watched his uh, daily walk and he felt his life was threatened on more than one occasion um, let's let's give this a little context because we're going to be talking about some things that I think a lot of folks are going to tend to dismiss as well that's hearsay or this is a person that left the church and things like this but Brigham Young himself talked about poisonings going on during this time, didn't he? He even, at general conference, accused Emma of trying to poison Joseph Smith. Uh, one, one of our historians has uh, found that there were 18 poisonings once they entered Nauvoo. And uh, a good many of those were, had to do with the Nauvoo Legion. And if you remember the Nauvoo Legion, you had a 60% chance of being poisoned more than the normal population in Nauvoo. So you could almost say that if, if, if they weren't doing what the leadership wanted them to do, they were kind of vulnerable. That's one way of putting it. Now, William Wall was not just concerned about the direct threats against his life. He he saw what he, th what he considered Joseph Smith plotting against others' lives as well, didn't he? Yes, very, very much so. In fact, we'll probably get into it more, but he threatened Emma's life in, uh, in uh, section 132, verse 52, 3, and 4. You can read it there, that she will be destroyed. And she understood that to mean that she would be killed, according to William Law. And... Uh, so she was worried about it. Also, uh, Joseph Jackson, who's, we'll get into more of him as well, but he, uh, he said that Joseph had asked him to, uh, to do away with William Law because he, he had uh, become dangerous to the LDS Church. And uh, there are others, and prob probably the most prominent is, is the one we're going to spend a little time on, and that is ex-Governor Lyburn W. Boggs, who was the Missouri governor and drove the Mormons from the state of Missouri in 1838 and 39. Just a, a little context, I don't want to go too far down this road, but you, you hear people like Glenn Beck saying that Governor Boggs issued the only extermination order in the history of the United States, and yet Governor Boggs was simply quoting what Sidney Rigdon had warned, had threatened non-Mormons with in, in, on his July 4th sermon that same year, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, there's plenty of responsibility to go, go along on both sides of that one. So uh, you had the Mormons threatening to, that, that the United States was going to be overthrown, that everyone was going to be destroyed, and all these various things. And they were very public in these denunciations. And then Boggs, months later, quotes from Sidney Rigdon's sermon, says, well, you know, if, if Sidney Rigdon says it's going to be a war of extermination, oh, so be it. You know, it will be a war of Yeah, he drew first blood on, with that sermon. That's true. So the, you had 20 people killed in the Missouri War. Uh, I think it is three at uh, Hans uh, Mill. Crooked, well, Crooked, Crooked Creek River. And, and then uh, 17 at Hans Mill. The Mormons leave the state, but they, but they never forgave Boggs, did they? No, they didn't. 
They, they definitely did not, and I don't know. Do you want to talk about William Law's first uh, complaint? Yeah. As yeah, to why they left the church? Well, all three of these complaints kind of come under the same umbrella, and that is they just saw Joseph Smith breaking six of the Ten Commandments. He'd become a law unto himself. They felt like he had just, uh, uh, everything he did, he believed God would sanction it and did sanction it. It didn't matter whether it was taking other men's wives or setting up a political kingdom of God on earth to overthrow the government or assassinating enemies. Uh, it, uh, these are the, the main reasons why the laws left, and they're behavioral reasons. They're not, uh, not because of Mormon scripture. Joseph Smith had actually uh, prophesied the death of, of Wilburn Boggs, had he? He had, and uh, Boggs was, was governor, ex-governor Boggs was killed on uh, early May 1842. And he, they, tr they tried to kill him, right? They, they tried to kill him. They, they shot him twice in the head and at least once in the body, maybe twice. And miraculously, he lived. And, uh, and what I found interesting is, is that for the next two months in the newspapers, both in Nauvoo and outside of, of Nauvoo, uh, people are weighing in on this discussion. And the, the first person, one of the first persons to do this was the sitting governor of Illinois, Thomas Carlin, and he wrote Joseph Smith a letter, and he says, you know, you've predicted uh, that I would die a violent death, uh, and I never ta have taken you seriously, but you, everybody seemed to know that Joseph Smith may be involved in that, and so he says, I, have, I haven't taken you seriously, but now that Governor Boggs has been attacked, I'm watching you, I'm, I'm checking this out. And, uh, and, and that's kind of how it started. And, and then there were some denials in some of the uh, Nauvoo newspapers. And uh, other people stepped forward. A, a guy named um, George Hinkle says, uh, he writes Joseph a letter. He says, don't be denying you. You didn't say Governor Boggs would die a violent death within a year because I was in the grove. I heard you say it with my own ears. And, uh, and that's what... Uh, uh, John C. Bennett of the First Presidency. Then he was in good stead with Joseph Smith, and uh, and he says the same thing. He says uh, that Joseph Smith had uh, prophesied that the Governor Boggs, it's almost a quote, will die a violent death within one year, and he made that that he heard that uh, that speech by Joseph Smith in 1841, and sure enough, by May 5th. There's an attempt on his life. So it, it was pretty common knowledge, and this Governor, governor Carlin is picking up on it, and he says, uh, I'm watching you now that this has happened, because you've threatened my life, too. So the extermination orders, uh, what, October 1838, was yes. it? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so this is basically three and a half years later that he's actually shot. But it, yep. had, been, but it had been percolating all during this time. Oh, yeah, he never forgave Boggs. There's a real feelings there. But aside from that, you've got, uh, you've got other uh, comments on that. One of them is, uh, is uh, from another one, from a second one from John, John C. Bennett in saying, uh, just before the Boggs assassination, uh, Bennett says uh, to Joseph, where is, where's, uh, uh, where's Porter Rockwell? I haven't seen him in a while. And he says, he quotes Joseph Smith as saying, he's gone to fulfill prophecy. Unquote. And uh, Porter and that, Rockwell was actually arrested in Missouri. He on was suspicion. It, <laughs> yes, and he was put in the Missouri jail in, in Jackson County, Missouri, and uh, he eventually was let go because they didn't have any evidence. Um, but this is after the extermination order. So oh yeah, this is 1842 now. 40. And so, yeah, it kind of raises questions. If he's not over there to do this, what's he doing? Well, who knows? That Porter in, Rockwell in, in, was kind of, <laughs> he was kind of like a, I'm not even going to say a lackey, but he did whatever Joseph Smith wanted him to do. The, the Rockwells, his Dolly Rockwell and, and Porter go clear back to, to uh, Palmyra. Uh, they've, they've known each other forever, and Rockwell just did anything that Joseph wanted. He'd paint his house, he would run errands, he would do things, and so he's a very loyal individual. So anyway, he... He, he's, uh, he's gone to fulfill prophecy, according to Joseph Smith, and, uh, and, and that, so you've got 
four or five or six statements, and then maybe the most important is William Law, his second counselor, says that, that Joseph Smith told me that, poor, I see, that he had sent Porter Rockwell to assassinate ex-Governor Boggs. And this greatly bar bothered Law. And Law tried to get Joseph later when they tried to extradite, extradite him to Missouri to go, but Joseph Smith never did. Even if he had gone, I think he would have been exonerated because there wasn't any evidence. And there was also a man named Jackson, wasn't there, who... who well, that comes next. And e echoed the same things about... But William Law actually... He says, I can remember the actual words that Joseph Smith told me. This is in the, uh, this is telling his second counselor this, mm -hmm. William Law. It's a, he's a pretty credible s source. This guy had a, a, a good reputation before Mormonism, during Mormonism, and after Mormon. And after he left, he became a physician and went up to uh, uh, Apple River, Illinois, where he practiced medicine. Then he went up to Schulzburg. Wisconsin and practiced medicine and died up there. And he raised a wonderful family. I think one of them was a doctor, another one was a judge. In fact, it's one of his, his sons, <coughs> Judge Tom Law, who uh, talked uh, William Law into uh, doing an interview because he had never said one word on Mormonism for 40 years. He was so embarrassed that he was part of Mormonism that he just shut up after 1845 and didn't speak again for 40 years. But when he's interviewed on this one interview, before any questions are asked, he, he throws that right out. He says, uh, 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 he remembered that even like it was yesterday. It's something you not likely to forget, even though it was 40 years later. But the story doesn't end there because, uh, well, what, what, what Law says, he says, uh, Rockwell was sent to do the deed. It's kind of like a mafia hit deal. Uh, he says he, he failed. And then a, a man came to town from Georgia named uh, Joseph H. Jackson, a really sordid kind of guy. And, and in fact, Jackson wrote a book about his doings six weeks after, the, after Joseph Smith and Hiram were murdered. So it's very early. Uh, he's usually telling the truth, but not always. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Jackson <clears throat> said that that this, he brought Jackson in and let, let him sell uh, Joseph Smith's Nauvoo lots on commission. He and William Clayton were doing that. And, uh, and, uh, and he's, he's, according to Jackson, he says, you're just the sort of man I need. Because <laughs> he knows about his sordid past. Mm -hmm. And so they go out on a long uh, horse ride and uh, and Jackson says, and he, he spends considerable time on this in his book, saying, uh, I really, uh, can you get uh, Orson or, or, or in Porter Rockwell out of jail in Missouri? And I'll give you a lot of money if you will assassinate Boggs, because this is tried, and I, it's, it was a failure. And so Jackson takes him up on the idea. I mean, he's, he's kind of appalled, according to Jackson. Maybe he was in it. I don't know. But he, he goes there, and, and, and he can't see Porter Rockwell. And by the way, Porter Rockwell was in jail at that time. He says, I couldn't see him because there's so many in the jail. I, I, I just couldn't get his attention or whatever. Couldn't see him. Then he went to Boggs. Boggs wasn't home. He comes home and reports to Joseph. The thing that I thought was interesting about the report to Joseph uh, he starts giving his report, and Joseph lets him go for about uh, four or five minutes. And he says, well, did you kill Boggs or not? <laughs> and he says, well, no, he wasn't home. And he says, that was true. He was not home. But the thing that strikes me about this report is, is uh, how astonished Jackson is that Joseph thinks this Boggs has it coming to him. He is it's almost like it was a divine mandate that this man should be removed from the earth. And uh, that got me thinking because once Jackson comes home and gives his report, now it's, it's a year later when he comes back. I think it's in uh, 43 now, mid-43. Uh, the thought occurred to me one month later, section, oh, what section is it? Uh, 
It's a section in the Doctrine and Covenants. Oh my gosh, which forgotten what it is here. It's uh, um, yeah. It's a, in July twelfth of forty three. That's Doctrine and Covenants, one thirty two, verse nineteen and forty nine. And that says that Joseph Smith has been sealed up to eternal life. He has his exaltation and that his throne awaits him. This is after all this has apparently gone on with Rockwell and so forth. And I thought, well, how can he say that if this is true? And uh, it, it, it turns out that uh, it's in this section 132, verse 19 and 49, it says, the only reason, Joseph, you will not obtain your exaltation and uh, throne is if you shed innocent blood. And he says it twice right there in the section. And uh, I think what's going on here is that Joseph Smith does not view ex-Governor Bogg as innocent blood. He views him as guilty blood and has a right to die. And Joseph Smith is the the spokesman for God, and he can seal, he can bind, he can undo, he can do it all, and this man has got to go, and that's why he, he does it with a, with a conscience, according to, uh, uh, as, as if it was nothing, well, to, is, to Joseph Jackson. Well, years later, this is the same thing that we see with Brigham Young, isn't it? Because yeah. Mountain Men is Massacre, they kill 120 men, women, and children. Uh, you were telling me before the show, 90 of the 120 were or under the age of 20. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of teenagers. And they didn't there. bother to bury most of them or very poor and, burial. And Brigham Young, I mean, we know from like Wilford Woodruff's journal and yeah. he clearly viewed them as not innocent blood at all. Well, and he says when he went there to the site, vengeance is mine. He's quoting, what is that, um, an Old Testament reference. Yeah, well, the, was the California militia had actually put up a sign saying, yes. vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Yeah. And according, according to some of the people there, he gives the sign of the, of, of the square and they throw a lasso, they tear it all down. Well, th down. this kind of thing, this cursing type of thing is very much part of the mentality. I think it goes right back to, to what we're talking about here with Bog. I think that's where it begins. And Brigham Young simply carries it forward. And I've talked to some of the Lafferty children. All those, those blood murders were all revenge murders because they... They were, they were not innocent blood. They're guilty blood, and we're going to go get them. Uh, as late as 1880s, uh, Wilford Woodruff is going into the temple, and normally you put, uh, you put uh, names on there to bless them. He, he gathered up everyone who had ever opposed the work of God. I mean, politicians, religious leaders, whatever, puts them on the Walder and, prof and, and officially curses them, you see. This was part of, of this thinking back then. And, and I think this is what's this is the beginning of it, and it's one month after uh, Jackson fails. And and if you look at section one thirty five verse seven, which is the martyrdom of Joseph Smith or the murders of Joseph and Hiram Smith, if you look at that verse seven, it says five times in that one verse, and it's italicized by John Taylor wrote the section, uh, third president of the church. It, it says that Joseph and Hiram Smith were innocent blood five times in one w verse. They're really emphasizing this innocent blood thing. And having worked at the jail and talked to many, many all reds, uh, uh, people who were in jail for, and, and the Lafferty's especially, and the Kingston, this innocent blood thing is a big deal. This is where a lot of this comes from. So William Law, he's horrified that he hears the order to kill Governor Boggs. Uh, he sees that other people are being threatened. Emma's threatened. Uh, according to Brigham Young, a few months after Emma's threatened, Emma tries to poison Joseph, and that's according to Brigham. She tries and to poison Joseph on November 5th, 43, and we'll get into some things in a minute as to why she did it then. Yeah, and so this is reason number one. Uh, he's kind of... <laughs> Well, over his head. This, this is just extremely unsettling. It's a behavior problem. And, and William 
and Jane Law, they just thought, well, what are we going to do? You know, I mean, they're, they're, they're always talking about, well, we'll try to do what we can to influence the church. It's a, uh, publicly and privately. And so this is the first nail in the coffin for, for the laws. They've, uh, they don't like the direction things are going. This is a man that's out of control, and he thinks he can, uh, uh, he's a god. In fact, he declares himself to be a god and uh, or has himself ordained king of the earth. We'll get into that a little more in a minute. But he's a uh, law unto himself, and uh, they're very upset about it. In fact, uh, we have a graphic. I don't know if you're ready for that, but... Uh, yeah, this is, this is from a, a diary entry of William Wall the day that Joseph Smith died. Yep. Uh, he says, just speaking of Smith, he says, he was unscrupulous. No man's life was safe if he was disposed to hate him. He set the laws of God and men at defiance. He was naturally base, brutish, and corrupt and cruel. He was one of the false prophets spoken of by Christ who would come in sheep's clothing but inwardly and uh, be a ravening uh, wolf. Uh, his works proved it. He claimed to be a god, whereas he was only a servant of the devil and as such met his fate. And this is from a member of the First Presidency. They yeah, were he, very close. They lived a half a block away, and they went on double dates, uh, you know, before the, the rift occurred. So this is a man, he was the only counselor that was really functioning in the first presidency with Joseph Smith. Rigdon was sickly, and uh, John C. Bennett had been excommunicated in June of, uh, of 42. So it's, it's really, uh, Law is a prominent citizen. And it, William Law's brother, Wilson Law, he's a general in the Nauvoo Legion. I mean, these are prominent people. Dr. Robert Foster was the main physician, so forth and so on. So these are not average Mormons at all. They're, they're, uh, so this is the first nail in the coffin for the, the laws, so to speak. I want to move on to the other two, but I'd like to open up the phone lines. If you'd like to join in the conversation this evening, uh, we're very privileged to have uh, Grant Palmer with us again. And we're talking about why William and Jane Wall left the Mormon Church, a uh, former member of the First Presidency and the man who created the Nauvoo Expositor. And uh, we'll talk more about that in a few minutes here. But the phone number here, 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. All right, so the first major reason for leaving is there's murder afoot. A mafia-type hit murders and he gets the word that as he's becoming disenchanted with things that he may be next yes and that that begins to happen uh, certainly by the end of uh, 43 in December January 43 William Laws worried about it for his own life and that kind of leads into the second reason they leave what what was that well, that has to do with polygamy. And uh, William Law and Emma Smith found out that Joseph was practicing polygamy about the same time. That is in May of uh, 1843. And by then, Joseph had uh, 21 wives. That's when they found out. And, uh, and of course, Emma is pretty upset about it. And so she says to... Uh, Joseph, well, we're not going to get along here. She says, uh, if you can do it, so can I. And I'd like your second counselor, because he's such a sweet little man. Now, that's a lot of that is right in William Clayton's journal. I thought we were going to have a graphic on that, but, but we don't. But this is kind of the way it goes, and and, uh, and so. And who is William Clayton for those who don't? William Clayton is the is the chronicler, uh, chief scribe of Joseph Smith. And then he had some assistant scribes under him, and he is the backbone of the LDS history, especially in Nauvoo. And he stayed, and he stayed with the church his whole yeah, life. He goes west, and he, he has a four or five volumes. Uh, one of them is on his own personal stuff, but three or two or three or four of those volumes are very, very important to Mormon history. And the Elias Church 
is not going to release them. They will not be part of the Joseph Smith papers. And uh, historians are th hoping they would be, but they have ruled them out. So There's a number of those papers they don't release. Like the, they haven't released the minutes of the Council of 50, have they? No, and they had 17 meetings uh, that Joseph participated in. They have released the Council of 50 minutes from U Utah on. You know, the Council of 50, we're getting ahead of ourselves. The re yeah. reader's not going to know what that is. We'll get into yeah, that because yeah. that's the third reason that the, the laws right. leave, leave the church. But going back to polygamy, so... So, so uh, William Clayton's journal says this... If you can do it, so can I, and I'd like William Law. And then there's corroboration of that by Joseph Jackson and others. That, and so Joseph has a revelation. You can read it in section 132, verse uh, 51. And, uh, and this revelation occurs before section 132 is received. That's important. So from June 23rd, when Clayton records that this revelation offer until July 12th, when section 132 is given, Joseph and Emma are having this conversation. If you can do it, I can do it. And Joseph agrees. Okay, you can have, you can have somebody. Well, I want William Law. Uh, so at that point, I think that the, that the laws are approached about it's not wife swapping it's a substitute sex partner for Emma and William Law says the the offer was the following would you you can have a substitute sex partner Emma if you leave my young wives alone in the mansion house that you treat them well that you don't harass them and that's basically the deal. Well, from, from, from every indication, the laws turn this down. We're not going to do that. And then Joseph gets the revelation on July 12th in section 132, and you again read it in 51 through 54, and Joseph says, oh, I was just testing you like Abraham. Yeah. Wasn't um, a real offer at all. We don't have a graphic on this, but um, it says that she uh, that she that she stay herself. This is to Emma and partake not of that which I commanded you to offer yeah. unto her. That was the offer of the substitute sex partner. For I did it, saith the Lord, to prove you all. And yeah. and I want people to understand: you've got William Wall, who's who's validating these things, but you also have William Clayton, the official scribe. Yes, in his own journal stating that this is what and Clayton the followed was. him around and wrote everything down he said and did he's a very very good scribe so this isn't just disgruntled members from outside no, trying to ascribe something not to at this. all so this is a second reason that's beginning to bother the laws and then uh, that's that happens in July August the time you get to well, you, you get what you just read. And what does mm -hmm. it say? If you are to accept, you are not to have a substitute sex partner, Emma. Yeah. You are to accept all Joseph's wives and treat them. And if you don't, you will be removed. And uh, Emma Smith had a number of conversations with William Law about this. Emma understood that to mean she would be killed. Let, let me read the excerpt here. Um, going back, that she stay herself and partake not of that which I commanded you to offer unto her, for I did it, saith the Lord, to prove you all, as I did Abraham. And then skipping ahead uh, just a few, uh, just a verse. Let my handmaid Emma Smith receive all those that have been given unto my servant Joseph. I command mine handmaid Emma Smith to abide and cleave unto my servant Joseph and to none else. Yeah. And if she will not abide this commandment, she shall be destroyed, saith the Lord, for I am the Lord thy God, and will destroy her. And so Emma tells uh, William Law, says, I guess I'm going to have to do it. And, and, and Joseph, she, he interviewed Joseph, too. He says, I think she'll comply, because if not, she'll be removed. And, so and this, she was right. he was right. 
And so because this is, she says, what can I do? I've, I've got, I'm stuck here. And so, so this is July 12th, 1843, right? Yes, and then, but, so and November then the, 5th, she tries to poison him. <laughs> According to Brigham Young, no less. And, and yet, uh, yeah. And, and yet we get these, we get things like the American prophet where it sounds like sugar wouldn't melt in their mouths and yeah. they just loved each other and yeah. it was so wonderful. So the saga's not over there. Then in November, December, Joseph is, wants to have a Jane Law, who's 31, I believe, and very attractive, and she's pregnant also. And he wants to have her for a spiritual wife, which uh, I think, but I'm not absolutely sure, that is like a concubine or a wife for the night. That's what the concubinage was. And they'd often make that offer to, to married women. He made it to Sarah Pratt. He made it to Melissa Schindel. He, he made it to uh, Lucinda Harris. He made it to uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Fuller Warren. These are not offers of marriage. He says, I have the keys of Jacob. I can do what I want. That's the type of the thing. And Joseph, er, Jacob had both wives and concubines, you remember. But mm -hmm. this is kind of a concubine or a wife for the night. And it was okay, according to the... So he approaches, he approaches uh, um, Jane Law for two months, November, December. And then Joseph goes to... Uh, uh, to Joseph Jackson, according to Jackson, and, and Jackson says, well, uh, he, he, he says, look, I've been trying to persuade her of my doctrine of this spiritual wivery, whether it's marriage or whether it's uh, concubinage, I'm not certain, but it's one of the two. And uh, I've been trying for two months to persuade her to my doctrine, and, I, and I'm a failure, I can't do it. And that's when he hires uh, or asks uh, Joseph Jackson to assassinate William Law because he's a danger to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and he says he needs to be removed. I think it's this, he's offended the church, he's no longer innocent blood, that's the, that's the idea. But he says to uh, Jackson, but I want you to do it in such a way that he doesn't even suspect that I am behind it because I will still want to have Jane Law is either a, a polygamous wife or as a concubine. Most people don't recognize that Joseph Smith was actually married to 11 women who already had husbands living. And, and most a, of those are in 42, and then most of the single wives come in 43. And I don't know if Emma gets a hold of him and says, knock it off, when she finds out these married women. I, I don't know how much she knew or when, but... Anyway, this is the second thing that really, really disturbs William and Jane Law, and it's personal. So he's made a hit on, on her in July to be a substitute sex partner, and that doesn't work, and now he's trying to get her to be a wife, and he's hired Jackson. And we also, uh, Jackson also told uh, one of the Higby boys who swore out an affidavit in, in Warsaw that, uh, that uh, Jackson had told... Uh, or, or uh, been commissioned to make a, a hit murder on on, uh, on 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 William Law. So this is very unsettling to the laws. He resigns from the First Presidency January 8th, 1844. So he's been in, he's basically been in the First Presidency three years, 41, 42, see, two, three, three years. And then on April 20th, he and Jane are both excommunicated. They don't even know that it's a trial. And, uh, and, and so it goes. And then that's in April 18th of 44. And then the next thing you know, they're, they're about to write this one and only issue of the, uh, of the Nauvoo Expositor, which is the trigger that causes Joseph Smith's death and the exodus of the LDS people out of Nauvoo, uh, Illinois in, in, in February of 46. So this is very disturbing along with the, sec the first reason is hit murder on bogs and now you've got this polygamy thing. And the Nauvoo Expositor was accusing Joseph Smith of polygamy. A lot of affidavits on that. And Joseph Smith as mayor declares them a public nuisance. And libelous, yes. And destroys their press. Uh, for the viewer, Read this yourself. They don't take our word for it. You 
probably won't and, won't and shouldn't. Uh, it's, it's a one-issue newspaper. It's about the size of the Salt Lake Tribune, or Deseret News, and it's four pages. And you can read what is said there. And what is said is there's nothing false in there that I've been able to find. I've read it many times. You can go online and read this newspaper. It's uh, been reprinted by uh, Signature Books uh, uh, and even cleaned up the type. It's easier to read now. Uh, and it was because of him destroying the press. There had been a press destroyed earlier in Illinois, and this was considered uh, um, anti American. No, no. Yeah. yeah. And so. That's why Smith was arrested and taken to the Carthage jail in the first place. Yes, yes. So anyway, that's the second of the reasons. And uh, I mean, you know, again, it's just, it's out of control. You don't take your followers' wife. That's not part of the restoration of all things. There's nothing in the Bible that says you can take the wife of a, uh, who, who, uh, wife of a husband who's living. I mean, this is just off the wall and no the apologists don't have any answer for it. Well, this is really disturbing, to say the least. Then they begin to find out more information about uh, the 11 married women and, and all of these uh, other things. And four, again, four of these young girls were, that were married in 43, they're promised eternal life to their families if they will simply uh, go along and be married to Joseph. They're 15 to 17 years old. There's, Four of them, Helen Mark Kimball, uh, uh, the Whitney girl, uh, a girl named Flora Woodruff, and uh, one other, I can't remember, oh, Lucy Walker. And uh, they, uh, that's what Joseph is promising them, uh, that their whole kindred, to, which to me is really going over the top with a ceiling power because that interferes with the atonement. You, people are supposed to come unto Christ on their own. You can't promise whole families or whole uh, generations of exaltation just because this girl marries him. And, and Helen Mar Kimball especially felt the weight of that. She's a 14-year-old. And she says, well, I guess I'll do it to save my family. I, I don't want to get down uh, this rabbit trail, but just, just to note that at the time, the Doctrine and Covenants section 101 was being put forward before the world denying that polygamy was even taking place. And, they were, and Joseph Smith was just lying through his teeth and over and over and over. And yet the LDS church admits he was lying. Well, he, was, he didn't want to go to the penitentiary. It was against the law. Yeah. So, so they say it's against the laws, you know, they can't violate the laws of the land, but they were violating the laws in Missouri and in Nauvoo, weren't they? Sure. So let's move on. What's the third, what's the third reason? The third one is something that a lot of uh, our viewers probably won't be familiar with, and that is the, the secret political kingdom of God. Joseph Smith, in April 11, 1844, organizes the Council of Fifty. Sometimes they're called the Living Constitution. And these were 50 men that were going to help him go out and preach the gospel to the Indians. The, the philosophy kind of goes like this. It's in the Book of Mormon, by the way. Look at 3 Nephi 20, 3 Nephi 21, 3 Nephi 16, Mormon 5, and read those, and it, talk, it, it goes like this. Uh, the gospel is really for the Lamanites, the, the Indians, and the and they will eventually build the city of Zion in Jackson County, Missouri. The Gentiles, that's us, anyone who's not a Lamanite, that's the definition in the Book of Mormon. The, if they repent and join the LDS Church, then they will be able to participate with the Lamanites and build the city of Zion. That's the proposition. So when the, when the missionaries go out, they say, you know, this land really does belong to you that Whitey is, is taking this away from you. And, uh, and if, so the first approach is to try to get them to join the church. If they didn't join the church, then they would try to make alliances with, with these Indian tribes, especially in Missouri and uh, Illinois, because that's where Andrew Jackson had recently sent all a good number of the Indians, tribes. Uh, and so they would preach the gospel to the Indians. They'd tell them these things. And then when they, when they got enough alliances or enough big enough uh, converts, 
then they would declare war on the United States government. So Joseph Smith, what I didn't know, and what the Book of Mormon doesn't tell you, is that Joseph Smith had himself ordained king of the earth uh, in one of these secret council meetings. And if you talked about it, it was, the penalty was death. So it was a very hush-hush topic. And uh, so he's ordained king of the earth, and that's his plan. And he's the one that's going to lead them to overthrow the government. Two days after he is ordained uh, king of the earth, he predicts the overthrow of the overthrow of the United States government within a couple of years. So this is the, 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 this is the modus operandi, so to speak, that Joseph Smith is going to use. Now, this is a great era of states' rights. And, they, and, and when LDS people say, we like the Constitution, uh, they like the Constitution because it was porous enough and it was states' rights uh, era uh, that they thought they could develop this kingdom of God, this Council of Fifty, uh, and get and establish it in America. They soon found out they couldn't. That's why Joseph Smith is sending people to Oregon, outside of the United States, sending them to the Rocky Mountains as an exploration, and to, down to Texas, who was not yet a state. Uh, so they realized uh, that this isn't going to work out. But uh, Joseph's running for president, and if he, and they actually think that if he gets elected that then they would have a foothold inside the United States government, this political theocratic kingdom of God on earth. This is, this is, this is treason, folks. I want to flesh this out, but let's take a, a phone call here. Uh, we have Jeff from Taylorsville with us. Jeff, good to have you with us. Hi, Jason. Hey, uh, I have a question for Grant Palmer. Sure. I was wondering if he had any knowledge of whether or not Joseph Smith uh, considered it necessary to have the priesthood to do the initiatory and the washing and anointing. And if he was the only one who was able to do that at first, and then um, like what year the church would have changed that and let women be the ones who washed and anointed the other women in the church. Okay. Thanks for your call, Jeff. You know, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I know that uh, the endowment started out in the little red brick store, which was owned and operated by William Law, and they'd put up uh, blankets and so forth. And the ceremony was rather long because they, they all played the part of Adam and Eve, and they would crawl out on their belly. Uh, uh, raisins, I think, were used for the... Um, for the uh, the forbidden fruit, and it, it it took a while for all the for all these things to happen. Each couple would talk to the devil, and they were all playing the role of Adam and Eve. And uh, I think the original original ceremony didn't have Peter, James, and John in the ceremony. Uh, we have different accounts of it, uh, beginning with the Warsaw Signal in 1845. But I don't know when the the women and the men catered to men and women. I, I don't know that. So let's go back to the kingdom of God here. One, one of the themes, we've, we've used the quote numerous times from Parley Pratt, who writes in 1838 that if there's a Gentile left on this continent 50 years hence, and if they're not in a great measure overthrown within five to ten years, the Book of Mormon will have uh, proven itself. Well, he's just saying what Joseph Smith is teaching in the Council of Fifty in those 17 meetings that we don't yet have the minutes for, but which they say they're going to release eventually. And I think, I hope they will, because that will give us a real insight. Yeah, we, we have some insight because William Clayton was the secretary of the, of, the, of the Council of Fifty, and sometimes he would write in his journal rather than in the minutes of the Council of Fifty. So we, and, and certain extracts have come out of the... Uh, the uh, Clayton Journal, so we have that, but we don't have the minutes themselves yet. And here's a man who's one of the original 12 apostles who states that this is prophet. He says, I will state it as prophecy. Oh, yeah, they all believed it. That's all part of the Council of Fifty teaching. And, and each of these men are to go out and start a cell, you know, get the Indians going. And uh, if, you wanna, if, if you want more information on on all three of these reasons why William Law, William and Jane Law left the church, they can go to where? State worthy. Uh, if they go to gospelutah.org and drop us a note, we'll we'll 
send them the, the link to it. Or if you just go on Mormon Think and put Grant Palmer homepage and then follow it, everything that I'm talking about tonight is on my homepage. Uh, now, to give people a sense of what's going on, after the death of Joseph Smith, you have a declaration from the LDS Church to, to all the kings of the earth, don't you? Yeah, shortly after he dies in 1845, they sent it to all nations saying the real theology, the theocratic kingdom is here, come and join, and eventually we're going to, you know, this, this is going to engulf the earth, it's the great stone rolling out of the mountain, and this is what they're referring to. It's a political thing, it's not just, and they realize that they're going to run into, look, if you want to, I give three examples in one of the papers I've had published on this subject. One of them is, uh, it's, it's called, uh, Did Joseph Smith Commit Treason in His Political uh, Kingdom uh, Aspiration in 1844? And uh, you can go to that uh, uh, Mormon Think homepage, Grant Palmer, and, and that it gives three examples of where he's trying to set it up. And very briefly, he's trying to set it up in Nauvoo area, and they're, they're approaching the Indians on the Iroquois six the nation, or what's it called, the Six Nation Reserve of the, of the Indians that are there, uh, the various tribes. They're in Nauvoo. It, it's all being talked about. Uh, they also are, have a, an effort in Texas, and then they have one in, uh, where's the third one? Uh, oh, my gosh. Anyway, there's three examples if you want to go to the article on, on uh, did Joseph Smith commit treason. I ran this by a, a, a federal judge here who's a friend of mine, and he, he says that there's no question that Joseph Smith would have been convicted of treason or something along those lines had he lived a few years more. He would have ended up in the penitentiary. But, but this really disturbs William uh, Jane Law because, and you can read it in the, in the uh, novel expositor, and then they say in there, I think it's in the, page two, column two, it says, in future issues, we're going to be talking about this political kingdom of God. Well, wow, that was a real red flag to Joseph Smith. If he didn't destroy the press for polygamy, he may have been influenced. Well, we're not going to have that talked about because this, this is uh, uh, setting up a government within the government and it's treasonous and we don't want anybody to know this, but this is what we're doing. And it comes right out of the Book of Mormon and it comes right out of this Council of Fifty. And then Joseph Smith declares himself a god to this generation in the April 1844 the General Conference. So he's ordained king in, in March of 44, and then he declares himself a god. And boy, this sends William and Jane losses. This is it. We, we, we can't take any more of this. This is, this is, uh, this is unconstitutional. Uh, he's, he's, he's over the hill. He's, he's, he's a lawn to himself. He's a... And, and, and then you see the statement that he makes, the day Joseph Smith died, he writes in his diary, and you can see these kind of elements embedded within his final testimony, if you will, of Joseph Smith. I, I find it striking that despite all these things, they, they try to start a, a reformed church that still holds to the Book of Mormon, still holds he, to all these He's things. the first break off from Mormonism and, he, and it's organized right in his own home and it's called the Reform or the Church of Zion. And they're still trying to reform it, but they've given up and saying, he's, this is, he, he's out of control, he's a law unto himself, and just like his testimony says the day he died, he writes in his diary. And, uh, and, and so they leave, uh, they, they leave and they never return to Nauvoo, and he never talks about Mormonism after 1845 for 40 years until his son prevails upon him to do so. But, uh, and this, this declaring himself a god, uh, we actually have records of this in terms of what happened in the Nauvoo temple, don't we? Yes, there's, unknown to almost all Mormons, is uh, the, there was a hierarchy of ordinances that went on in the temple. Most of the, the audience who's LDS would know about the endowment and the sealing marriage and then second anointing. Is, but the next one was Godhood, ordinance to become a God, and then Godhead. And that may get into this Adam-God thing that Brigham Young later entertained, but uh, we don't want to go there. But there's a hierarchy of these ordinances, and I don't, I don't know how they impact with what went on in the Council of Fifty 
uh, they often did these ordinances more than once. But it wasn't just Joseph Smith. It was uh, John and Lenora Taylor, Brigham Young and one of his wives, Haber C. Kimball, uh, 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 John Taylor, and they were, they were all involved in this. This is a, Joseph Smith isn't kidding. He's ambitious and he is, uh, he's uh, audacious. He's bold. He says, I'm laying a foundational that will change the world revolutionize the world, I think is the word he says. Well, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time, but I really appreciate you coming and being with us. Uh, this, is, this is great. We'll have, if anyone would like more information on this, if they'll drop us an email, we'll link them to the articles uh, by Mr. Palmer and uh, has the, the documentation. Once again, I'd like to invite you to our debate Friday night, April 24th, 7 p.m at the University of Utah in the Social and Behavioral Auditorium. I'll be debating Pastor Scott Dalgarno of the Mainline Presbyterian Church, Wasatch Presbyterian, over homosexuality. I'd also like to invite you to worship with us. Uh, we are part of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. We meet Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. at 8630 West Magna Main Street, that's 2700 South. Sunday school is at 945. We have a sister congregation, Berean Presbyterian, meets at 3350 Harrison Boulevard in Ogden at 9 a.m. with Sunday school following. If you'd like more information, go to our website, gospelutah.org, or give us a call at 801-969-7948. Till next week, we wish you the Lord's greatest blessings. Please read your Bibles. Good night. <laughs>